that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 527th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Invisible Man, also known as Tom Fennell. In the flesh, but not in the studio. That's right. That's what it is. Okay. Um, uh, I think for those who don't know, and there's a, I would guess at least two or three of you, um, this is uh, news about energy and climate change that has been uh, come out in the last week, uh, starting the 8th of June and ending yesterday, today being Thursday the 15th, so it goes from the 8th to the 14th. This is all taken from my blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. If you go down the screen, if you're watching this on a computer, you can, you know, scroll down. You should be able to get a, um, a, uh, um, you should be able to get a uh, um, uh, a link to the uh, website that Tom and I use to to f do the show, and also uh, a a file that you can download. Anyway, we're there's links on that that link to the original article. Yes, that's right, and you can some of those articles if you got the time. Are well written and lengthy, and they're, they're worth what? They're worth reading. Yes, absolutely. So we're starting on the eighth of June, and we have an item that we're going to begin with, which is uh, the the. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm a little bit uh, uh, out of sync here with reality. Um, this is from Clean Technica. What do you? Well, we got a picture of a couple of Volvo buses. That's correct. One of which is double deckered, you'll notice. And it says, and I quote, 150 double decker electric buses from Volvo are headed to the UK. Yeah, one of the largest double decker bu electric bus orders ever made in, in the UK. UK coach and bus operator Stagecoach, that's the name of the company, ordered 150 electric double decker uh, buses and 90, uh, I'm sorry, 39 electric single-decker uh, buses from Volvo Buses. It is the largest electric bus order Volvo Bus has ever received. Well, it's just, it's a, uh, how would you say it, a prediction of times to come. I think it is. And when I think of electric, I'm, I'm sorry, when I think of double-decker buses, I think about a short time in my life when I lived in Devon. And I lived in... in um, an area where there were there were uh, hedgerows, and the roads wound, and they had they were sunken two feet, and the the earth from the sinking of the roads was piled next to the roads so that the hedges on the sides could be higher, and the hedges were on top of those. So it was you were like driving down a narrow road that had walls on the side, green walls, and these double decker buses buses would drive down those roads. They were scary. I bet. Yeah. I didn't <laughs> drive on them. I was too young at that time. Anyway, we ha we should go on, I think, unless you've got more to say about this. Well, we just got, we got the picture of the double-decker buses, and uh, yeah. they tried double-decker buses in New York City yes. very unsuccessfully. Yes. Yeah. People didn't like them. People didn't like uh, double-decker buses. I don't remember when that happened. I kind of knew that it did. It wasn't very long ago. It was only on Fifth Avenue. Oh, really? Okay. All right. We should go on. We have a picture here of a clownfish. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah, I, I, you know, these that that's a real fish, and they live in the ocean, and they're not very big. But this is from the BBC. As oceans, as ocean oxygen levels dip, fish face the uncertain future. 
Yeah, global warming not only increases ocean temperatures, it also triggers a cascade of effects that are uh, stripping the seas of oxygen. This now is that's not good news. No, with global warming, warming oceans around the world are becoming ever more deprived of oxygen, forcing many species to migrate from their usual homes. And really, this is um, this is a serious problem. Fish. Well, the article says it's an uncertain future, and that's accurate. Well, it's not just ocean fish. I mean, brown trout, for example, live abundantly in Vermont streams. They won't in the future because the streams are warming up, and those trout need to have cold water to live. Like in. cold water, right? Yeah, they they're very active. They use a lot of oxygen, and the water has got to have a lot of oxygen in it. Cold water uh, water holds more than warm, and um, there you go. So, we will go on. Moving right along, we got a nice picture of a shell truck. We have a picture of a shell truck. And that truck, if you notice, by the way, is on the left side of the road. And that's because it's in England, in England or in the UK anyway. And they drive on the left side of the road. In the United States, the right side to drive on is the right side. But in the UK, the right side of the road is the left side. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes sense. I've done it in Ireland. Ireland, they drive like they do in the UK. Yeah. And I rented a car, and I had the hardest time not wanting to run over to the right side of the road. Yeah, I know. I know. And people... It's, it's automatic, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, I know. This is from Offshore Technology. Shell advertisements banned in the UK due to, quote, misleading content. Yeah. The UK's Advertising Standards Authority has banned multiple advertisements for oil giant Shell due to misleading content. According to the ASA, the adverts, advertisements, quote, omitted significant information about the overall environmental impact of Shell's business activities in 2022. They wouldn't do a thing like that. Oh, no, they wouldn't do a thing like that. That would be horrible. Yeah, okay. So Moving right along. Moving right along. Here we go. Um, Friday, June 8th already. Boy, time is flying. Time is flying. And this is a solar project. I have to put it up on the screen. This is a solar project that, uh, that uh, um, is in California. Pretty big solar project. This is a, yeah, it's a big solar project. And it, I think it actually is... Um, talked about, I guess not, but you, go ahead, read the, read the title. That is in California. U.S. solar market expected to triple in size in five years. Yeah, this is not the, the installed capacity. This is the amount being installed every year. The U.S. solar industry installed 6.1 gigawatts of capacity in the first quarter of 2023. According now, this, to, is ma this is maximum output capacity. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, you know, it's the solar capacity. It's the output of the, all the solar cells that were installed. Yeah, yeah, I guess you got it. Oh, okay. Yeah. According to a report from the Solar en Energy in Industries Association and Wood McKenzie, Wood McKenzie forecasts that the solar market will triple in size. So tripling in size, you're going to... Um, uh, 18 gigawatts uh, being installed in each quarter. Gigawatts is gigawatts, buddy. I guess it is. You know, I mean, we've had, in the last 40 years, we've had two nuclear power plants that are coming online, and they're one gigawatt each. What does that I'm tell you? I'm looking at that picture, and it looks like there's uh, stuff growing under the panels. It does, doesn't it? Well, it's grass, it looks like. Well, it might be grass, but it could be low, low growing uh, vegetables and stuff. It could be. I don't. But see it makes a lot of sense to grow something under your panels because otherwise it's wasted space. That's right. If you do something like uh, radishes or something like that that don't require <laughs> a lot of height, you know, you 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 got a double income. That's right. Plant tomatoes under there. Okay. That works. Potatoes. Yeah. Okay. Say potatoes. I say. To, to, Potatoes. Potatoes. Yeah, well, <laughs> tomatoes also. Tomatoes, <laughs> the, tomatoes like the shade a bit. They okay. do. Matter of fact, they, they, they get more output in the shade than they do in a bright sun. That's, that's what we've read. Okay, this picture 
just makes me feel scared. <laughs> this this next picture. Oh, the next picture coming up. Yeah. Oh yes. That's that's a a cruise ship in Norway, and it's supposed to be in a fjord, and maybe it is in a fjord, but it looks to me like it's about to get crushed by the ice. Anyway, that's exactly what it looks like. I don't think that's really what's going on. You're getting some. Uh, perspective from a from I a think you are yeah this is from clean technica what do you got for a title well the first word is hard for me to say Hurdy in Norway plans electric cruise ship with sails and solar panels yeah Her, Norway's heard of Gruten I and I know I'm pronouncing that right wrong operates a small fleet of cruise ships you know uh, Greta Thunberg. Her name is Greta Thunberg. It's like it's, it's like she's turned it into she's turned four syllables into seven. And you know, in Norwegian is the same kind of thing. Norway's Hurtigruten uh, de Gruten operates a small fleet of cruise ships that ply the country's coast, giving people a chance to witness the wonders of Norway's fjords. I don't know that Norway, Norwegian works the same way Swedish does in that respect, so make fun of me, if you will. Now it says it will build a battery electric cruise ship that feels actual, features actual sails that will be covered by solar panels. Now that's an interesting concept. Yes, it is. It's an interesting concept. So you have more on that? No, let's move on. Now I've got a picture that I really like. A picture of the monsoon season in India? That's right. I, if you had said that was Louisiana, I wouldn't have known the difference. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Okay, this is from the BBC. El Nino, planet warming weather phase has begun. Yeah. Scientists confirm that El Nino had started. Experts say it will be likely to make 2000, uh, I'm sorry, the year 2024, the world's hottest year ever. They fear the world will go past 1.5 degrees Celsius warming mark, partly due to the effects of, uh, to its effects, that is to say El Nino's effects on world weather. They could include, that. those effects could include a drought in Australia, increased rain in the southern United States, and a weak monsoon in India. So there's side effects of these uh, climate changes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. And they're not, they're not good for the most part. No, well, I mean, I mean, you want to run a farm, have stable weather. Wherever you are, make sure that you're in a place where the weather is stable. You don't want to have dry. Or at least you can predict what the weather's going to be. Something. You don't want to have unforeseen drought one year followed by unforeseen flooding the, the, the next. It's just, that does not work very well. No, it doesn't work very well. And we're going to see a really good picture of that later in the show. But I guess we should move on to the next. Uh, uh, we're up to Saturday, June 10th. Well, we get a nice picture of some mushrooms. Yeah, and this this picture, I found this picture because the one with the story had a, a, a was something that I couldn't copy either because it was copyrighted or... Um, because I couldn't determine what the copyright situation was. This is from the Japan Times. That picture of a mushroom is from Unsplash, and the title on the, pic on the picture said, Unknown Species. So we don't know what the species here is, but the mushrooms that we're gonna talk about in the story could be anything. You know, you just, you would have to be a mycologist in order to know, um, what the situation is. Anyway, you have a title. So whether they are or not, they can play a key role in solving the climate crisis. That's right. The scientific journal Cell Press. Now, I have to tell you, this comes from the uh, Japan Times, and Cell Press, as I can uh, determine it, is not a journal. It is, it is, the journal is called Cell, but nevertheless, let's just go on, is publishing a story showing that a group of fungi with mycorrhizal systems draw down and store more than 13 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. And I will get back to that in a minute. Now, just hold on a minute. 
Um, that's nearly the annual greenhouse gas output of China and the United States combined. That's a lot of gas. Yes, it is, but it's wrong. It's wrong. Yeah, I looked at that and I thought, 13 million tons? That is not very much. I mean, I would bet that Vermont has got 6 million tons. Um, and when I looked it up, I could not find the article, which did not surprise me. The Japan Times article was there, but the, but the study that it referred to had been reported in Bloomberg as something that was about to appear, and the cell press had not yet generated it. Okay, now here's the deal. I looked yeah. into the numbers here, and I think what that means is not 13 million tons, but 13 billion tons with a B. Okay. That's a lot of tons of carbon dioxide. That and, is for real. Yeah, and that is a big deal. Now, the reason... Well, because before that, you're ahead of the game. Otherwise, if, you, if it gets into the atmosphere, it's going to do bad things. Yeah, and what's, what's ha the, the carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere. The mushrooms will draw it down. Now, here's the deal. According to the research that I did, which some of which came from the author of this upcoming article that Bloomberg was talking about, the, the author of that um, and, and other places, I found that approximately 90% of all of the carbon dioxide that has been stored in soil depends upon mushrooms at some point. No kidding. No kidding. And the amount... 90%. 90%, yes. And, and the stuff that they do, Tom, this is unbelievable. It's like they, there's a tree over here, there's a tree over here. The two of them are separated. One of them gets plenty of light, one of them gets little light. And the, and the, are you there, Tom? Yeah. Okay. One of them gets a lot of light, one of them gets very little. The mushrooms will actually move sugar from one of them to the other. But they're talking to each other. They're talking to each other through the mushrooms. And another thing, when you put ammonia as a fertilizer on the field, the mushrooms stop functioning. Is that so? Yeah. This is a big deal. This means our agriculture is wrong. Our agriculture can be fixed fairly easily. Our forestry practices are wrong. If we get this right, we could draw down as much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as we want. Well, how about that? So there's hope. I'm saying we got to get off the, off the um, my, uh, my opinion, obviously, but we've got to start stop burning fossil fuels. But we've got to that many times. We, we've <laughs> got to stop burning things, anything. Yeah, yeah but, the, but the other thing here, an other thing here, is by using nature in the way that in, in ways that we have not imagined, we are going to be able to return Earth to a stable and being a stable uh, climate. We have oh, to, we have to do it. That's what we want to do, but we got vested interests that are working opposed, opposed to that because they don't want stranded assets. Well, they, they don't mind the idea of being cursed by their own ch children, do they? No, that's, called, that's further on down the road. They I guess it is. Okay, we should move on, Tom. This is an article come from Good. Clean Technica coming up. And, a nice picture of a wildfire. Yeah, a nice picture of a wildfire. These pictures of wildfires depress me. Um, what do you have for time? Wildfire smoke is a climate change wake-up call for the USA. Yeah. The New York Post ran a headline this week telling readers to blame Canada. Oh, this is cute as though it's the Canadians' fault. Well, some of it is, not much of it. Blame Canada for the smoke hanging over the city. It's a typical, it is typical of reactionaries in the United States to look around and refuse to see what is happening before their eyes. Those, those fires in Canada are because of smoke that comes out of pickup trucks in, in Texas. The climate crisis is arriving early and we are not ready. That's what the article says. I think it's right. Yeah, I think I think it's right. Unfortunately, and like, like I already said, the people 
people who own the assets are afraid they will be stranded. Yes, that's right. Okay, we are up to a, a rather depressing looking picture of a coal burning p power plant. And that, it, that is probably not in India, but it, nevertheless, it's, this is this um, article. It came is, from a publication called The Hindu, so we're... Uh, no, the, the uh, picture didn't. The picture came from oh. Unsplash, but this article came from The Hindu, which is Indian. So what do you got? It's an interesting picture there. There's one smokestack, but all the rest are cooling towers. And, and you know, that's the thing. Because you see that thick smokestack, you know that this is from a coal burning plant. There's a couple of yes. things about coal burning plants that are giveaways. One of them is the is the fuel uh, conveyors set in at rest. Yes, yes, yes. And the un another one is these big thick smokestacks. Um, or anyway, this is from the Hindu, and you got a um, a, a title. Switching from coal to renewables can save Kerala with nine thousand crore of your rupees in five years. And let me explain a couple of things. A crore is a unit in the Indian numbering system. It's equal to 10 million. Yeah. And Kerala is a state located in the southwestern coast of India. Good. Thank you, Tom. Replacing its coal power contracts with renewable energy can save the Indian state of Kerala. Kerala. Is that, is that pronounced right, Tom? I call it Kerala, so I oh, think... Oh, okay. Well, you might have it right. 9,000 crore rupees, which is $1.09 billion over a five-year period, according to a study by Think Tech Tank Climate Risk and Horizons. The report recommended phasing out all coal by 2030. A good, it's a good recommendation. I think so. Yeah. Okay. We have more on that, or should I move us on? We're, worried. We're, we're, we're not worried, but people are worried about stranded assets. So people they, are worried about stranded assets, yes. And their, their family is going to wind up being a stranded asset. And it's going to be... But that's in the future. Huh? But that's in the future. Yeah, well, you know, in yeah. our society, we don't think about the future much. Bingo. Okay, but, we, really. we have an article from Clean Technica. Nice picture of some aeroplanes. Aeroplanes. This is their, their Airbus aeroplanes. And you'll notice that one of them look, looks like it has big, fat jet engines. That's the highest one. The lowest one has propellers. And the one in the middle has some kind of weirdness um, uh, propulsion system. Okay. It's so, got a whole bunch of small... Small fans. Small fans, right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, anyway... What do you got for a title? Megawatt, electrical motor designed by MIT engineers, could help electrify aviation. Yeah. That's it. This is wild. To electrify large commercial airliners, megawatt scale motors are required. A megawatt scale motor is a big motor. I would say. <laughs> I would say. Yeah, to meet this need, a team of MIT engineers is now creating a one megawatt motor to be powered by a battery or fuel cell. That could be key, uh, a key stepping stone toward electrifying larger aircraft. And um, the, the idea of a megawatt motor is, is a little less surprising when you think of it in terms of what does a megawatt generator look like? We've got wind turbines that have generators inside them that go to 14 megawatts. A megawatt, oh, okay. a megawatt for a wind turbine is, is small. Not a whole hell of a lot, is it? No, it's not. And when you think, what's the difference between a motor and a generator? You know about that, Tom. What, what is the you difference? You run a motor backwards, it's generated. Three <laughs> certain motors. Yeah, when the United States was bombing um, uh, Bosnia under Bill Clinton, um, the the uh, there was a there was a town in in Bosnia where they they had their electricity cut off for a year and a half, and there was a guy in the town who was a kind of a I don't know what he did but he took a you know he might have been a tinkerer he might have been an electrical engineer I don't know but he took a a motor out of a washing machine 
and rigged it up a little differently and set the, the shaft to a paddle, a wheel, and put it on a little raft which he moored in the middle of the river that went through the town. And that little combination was enough to give him one light bulb and one radio. Bingo. And that's how the town got its news for months and months that? and months. Yeah, how about that? Today how it would be easier because you'd have solar panels. But, you know, the point is the technology that goes into building those wind turbine uh, turbines can be, some of it can be used for um, aviation. The big deal is you've got to make it light. I think you're going to see like the central picture there with a bunch of small motors rather than one great I big one. I think you're right. I do. I do. And it, the plane doesn't have to look like that, but, you know, there are many ways that planes can look. Okay, we've got a picture of Manhattan coming up. What do you think Looks, of this? It like Manhattan to me. It looks like Manhattan to me. <laughs> I don't know where that is. I haven't been in Manhattan in years. That's pretty close to Times Square. Is it? Okay. I will take your word for that because I just don't know. Anyway, this is from CNN. New York City will charge drivers going downtown. Other cities may be next. Now, we've talked about something like this before. We have indeed. New York City is moving ahead with a landmark program to toll vehicles entering lower Manhattan. The Federal Highway Administration signed off on the release of an environmental assessment, and the public review period is coming, uh, is ending on Monday. Now, I got to tell you, this, this particular story appeared on Sunday, which was last Sunday, and the public review period ended last Monday. We're just, oh. yeah. So there's, there's no review time left. But, uh, I mean, they, they didn't uh, decide to do this on Sunday with a public review period lasting one day. This was something that people yeah, right. had notice of for months and months and months. Well, if you go to downtown New York, where, and you if you took all the taxi cabs away, there'd be practically nothing there. <laughs> when I was young, Tom, I, w I spent uh, some time as a student at, at Columbia. And, uh -huh. and for that, I lived in Manhattan. Of course. And I remember going into some student common, whatever it was, because I was in a dormitory, and seeing the news and somebody on the news said, air quality on Wall Street was, su was such that uh, the carbon monoxide level was above industrial safe limits. How about that? So if you were going to work within industrial safe limits on Wall Street, you had to be wearing a mask. Yep. But not just any mask because the mask had to be one that actually delivered bottled air because nothing that would remove carbon monoxide could be used in oxygen levels as low as, there were, as they were on Wall Street. You got a double, uh, a double whammy there. You can't just filter it out. No, uh, carbon monoxide is a little bit easy, difficult to remove. It can be done. But um, if you're in a carbon uh, monoxide environment, the safe thing to do is to put on a, an air pack where you're almost like a scuba diver, where you're breathing air. Where well, you're getting fresh oxygen. Exactly. And uh, there, there are a couple of other um, gases that are about as, as poisonous as carbon monoxide, roughly. Um, one of them is hydrogen sulfide. One of them is, is hydrogen cyanide. Uh, cyanide is kind of nasty. You can't, you cannot work in a cyanide environment with, an, with a, an air pack because the cyanide will attack you by going through your skin. No kidding. No kidding. This is a problem. That's a no-win situation. It is. is it? But the one that people thought were the worst was hydrogen sulfide. And the reason is because it smells like rotten eggs in low quantities. But the first effect of poisoning is that you lose your sense of smell. <laughs> the second effect is a mild euphoria. Oh, feels good. Yeah. And then you faint, then you, then you die. Well, yeah, and I used to work in an environment where there was a lot of hydrogen sulfide being used, and I did get gassed by oh. it once, and I knew that I had had a deep whiff of really strong stuff. 
So I stopped what I was doing. I went into the lunchroom, bought myself a Coca-Cola or something. And when I drank it, I could, I could taste that it was sweet, but it had no flavor at all aside from that. So I went to the other supervisor on the shift and I said, I've been gassed. I'm, he, he, and I said, it's not bad. I think I could just go out and sit in the parking lot, but I've got to get out of work. And so he kind of did the stuff that was necessary to, to, to the, the stuff I was doing was very simple. It was just that I was walking with an open beaker in front of me and the open beaker had, had ammonium sulfide in it and I just got a whiff of that gas. And uh, I should have been more careful. I, I made a mistake there. My smell came back about two, mo two hours later and it came back altered. And the story that I heard was it's permanently altered. I don't know that that's true, but I could smell things that I had never been able to smell before. Uh -huh. Like salt. You can smell salt? I could tell the difference between sodium chloride and sodium iodide. Well, I can't. I'll tell you something else. There's a chemical called cadmium chloride, which is supposed to be odorless. And all of a sudden it had a very strong smell of that was combined the smells of burnt leather and rotting fish. It was bad. Oh, sounds good. <laughs> it, was, it was one of the most yeah. vile smells I've ever smelled. And in the books, no smell. How about that? I, I strongly recommend that nobody try gassing yourself with hydrogen sulfide to change your I don't think smell. it's a good idea. Not a good idea. Very bad idea. You come too close to death doing that. Okay. Well, we, we've been looking at New York. Now let's take a look at Philadelphia. That's, that's what we should do. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. We have a picture of Philadelphia from Unsplash, which means it was not from the article. And I'm going to put that up so people can see it. And um, this is from CNN. Cities across the Northeast experience better air quality as hazardous wildfire, wildfire smoke subsides. Yes. Sorely missed blue skies are returning and cities across the northeastern United States have better air quality after the monstrous cloud of smoke from the wildfires in Canada dissipates. The area of Canada that has burned so far is a, more than twice the size of New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. And today in the news, the smoke is back. But it's not in the Northeast. It's in the upper Midwest. So there we go. it's got to go all the way around it's, the world to get there. To no, get no, here. no. It's it's not. It's if our smoke was coming from Quebec. Their smoke is coming from Ontario. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I think yeah, we should, generally it goes from uh, east, west to east. Mostly, and the, and the the reason we got it was because of a low pressure system that was uh, that was I think. Um, northeast of us, which was just bringing so it low pressure system was sucking it that, That's, in that direction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we should go on. Uh, we're be. up to uh, Monday, June 12th, and we have a picture of a nuclear power plant. Let me put that well, up. Some, some cooling towers, but you notice there's no chimney. There's no ch Well, the chimney might be behind one of those things, kind of hiding so that you can't see it. Because oh, nuclear plant doesn't have a chimney. It, some of them do, but they have really skinny chimneys. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's really kind of weird, but I think that funny-looking building in the foreground is the um, is where the reactors are. Okay, this uh -huh. is this is from the Star. The EU to try again for. Well, let me get closer so I can read it. EU to try again for a renewable energy deal after nuclear... Row. 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 Row, yeah. After yeah, nuclear... They, they, had a, they had a spat. The European... Yeah. Okay. yeah the European Union country, com, countries will try to pass a deal on new renewable energy targets, which were stalled by concerns of France and other states. That, by states, they mean nations that the law uh, sidelines nuclear energy. The countries lodged last-minute opposition to the more ambitious EU goals 
for renewable energy last month. And I, I see, uh, saw today that, or yesterday, that Sweden is one of the countries and they have come up with an alternate plan. So, I don't know. You got any thoughts on that, Tom, or should we go on to this picture? I think we ought to move on. Yeah. We have a picture here of, of a hydrogen thing. And, I, you know, I'm really dissatisfied with this picture because so, it doesn't make sense to me. I think it's a good, good picture, but you got to study it. Well, I, yeah, but when I studied it, it just confused me. In the middle of that whole thing is what looks like a chemical equ equation which says yes. H2 plus OH yields H plus H2O. Well, it balances, but you're not going to find OH anywhere, as far as I know, as a molecule, and you're not going to find H anywhere as a molecule. And no, you're right. It, and the, 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 those two things have got charges, and, so it's, and it's the charges don't balance. Physically it's physically incorrect. Yeah, the, it, the OH has got a charge, H has got the opposite charge, and the charges in this equation don't balance. So I'm, you know, that's part of why I'm unhappy. But the the picture does actually convey the problem, and the and this is uh, from uh, Clean Technica. So what do you got for a time? Hydrogen can make global heating worse. Yeah. C Cicero, a climate and environmental research study based in Oslo, has published a report that says while the use of hydrogen may result in no emissions, leakage from the hydrogen distribution system can be 12 times as destructive as carbon dioxide to the environment. Now, so the, the, the py pyrolysis product of hydrogen is water. Yes. So it doesn't cause any problems, but if the hydrogen leaks out before it's burnt, yeah. it can be big problems. Yeah, and and the 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 I you know I looked at this and I looked at it and I looked at it and I'm sure that if I sat down with the people at Cicero, they would be able to in, educate me about science about things that I don't know, but it doesn't make sense to me. So I don't know what to say. <laughs> You know, should we go on, Tom? Yes, yes. I, I just as soon escape, uh, soon escape uh, that. We have a picture up, and it's one of those pictures that makes my eyes hurt. Aha. Uh -huh. Because the so, sun is shining in my eyes. A whole bunch of, of, uh, whole bunch of generators. That's whole right. Windmills, wind turbines, I should say. Windmills. But, you know, Tom, when I look into the sun, my eyes hurt. And when I look at a picture like this, I feel like my eyes are hurting. It's, <laughs> it's, it's weird. This is Clean Technica. It is pretty weird. Yeah. This is from Clean Technica. What do you got? Solar and wind power now producing more electricity than fossil fuels in the EU. This is, this is really impressive. The well, it's, a, it's, it's a sign of the times, but it, it's also a step in the right direction. Yeah. The European Union has hit a crossover point. For the first time, solar power and wind power have combined for more electricity generation than fossil fuels in the European Union. That's actual generation, not capacity. That's right. It's generation. It is generation. They made more electricity from solar and wind than they did from fossil fuels. Last month, the two core renewables of the clean energy era achieved a historic crossover point. It is historic, isn't it? It's what? Historic. It is historic. And I want you, I want you to notice, Tom, this did not include, you know, burning, burning wood from forests, and it didn't include burning waste, and it didn't include hydroelectric. And there's a bunch of other stuff that it just didn't include. It, this is just wind turbines and uh, solar. So this that's is wind and solar. That's, that's it. right. It also doesn't include nuclear. But that's you know where do you put nuclear? I wouldn't call nuclear renewable. It sure isn't fossil fuels. Okay, should we go on? Can't dance. We are up to Tuesday, and um, I'm just going to say this is Tuesday, June 13th, and we've got a picture of a girl who looks like she's somewhat taken aback by Hayes. 
Well, I think that's what exactly it is. Yeah, this is from CNN. Last week's haze may be just the beginning of a new summer of smoke. Wow. Yeah, what we saw unfold in the eastern seaboard last week was surreal. Well, it wasn't surreal. It was just hazy. But just because the smoke has more uh, mostly cleared for now doesn't mean those apocalyptic scenes will not be back. Canada's fire season is just starting. And this could be the summer of smoke. And you know, when I saw that, I thought to myself, um, I saw an article which said, this is the new normal. And I said... I'm afraid you're right. No, it's not the new normal. This is, It's going to get worse. It's the new normal is going to be worse? Yeah. It's going to get worse until we really do something about it. It's not well, normal. You're right. we got to get we got to get real about it and stop burning things. That's right. And we got to... And everybody should plant a mushroom in his backyard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. More about this, or should we escape? Move on. Okay. We have a picture here of a, um, this is a rendering of a, of a Volkswagen fac factory. And well, if you look at that picture closely, that is a very, very large building. Yeah, it is. There's a road going around it, and the road looks like it has tractor trailers on it. it I might not them and they look tiny. They look tiny. And I don't see any cars. Yes, I do. I see a car. It's tiny. I it, think that's a car. It's like a grain of sand. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. This is from uh, Clean Technica. And Volkswagen claims dry battery process will save hundreds of dollars per car. Yeah. Volkswagen intends to bring a new dry coating process for electric vehicle batteries into large-scale uh, production, according to Der Spiegel. Dry coating reduces consumption of energy in the production of battery cells by 30%, which could lower the cost of electric vehicles. So they're saying they're, they have a way to lower the cost of electric cars by a couple hundred dollars, and that's significant. Well, I know that... Uh... We haven't seen any changes in battery technology for a hundred years. Yeah. Virtually no changes at all. And now all sorts of smart little guys and smart little sellers and smart oh, little addicts, all of that, are doing their own research and they're coming up with some very interesting I results. Th I think we have a battery co a thing coming up in, in just the next couple of slides. Uh huh. And, and uh, let me take a quick look here. No, I guess not. Um, maybe it'll be next week. There was a there was a an announcement that um, Form Energy, which is in Somerville, Massachusetts, um, is building, um, and they they have a firm contract for a ten megawatt, one hundred what what was it, ten mega megawatt, hundred and fifty megawatt hour. That doesn't sound right, but it's it's like it's like uh, uh, the the amount of time this battery can put out, output its 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 full load is just astonishing. It's like maybe it was ten megawatts, a thousand megawatt hours. I don't know. It's well, like I said, we we haven't seen any changes in batteries for the last hundred years, and then all of a sudden we've got but this. Every time you turn around, somebody's got something new. Absolutely. And some of these things will work well. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them will work. The one from Form Energy, they're saying that the, the cost of storing a, a kilowatt hour of electricity will be half a cent. Half a cent. Half a cent. So if you've got, if you've got a solar panel and the solar panel is delivering electricity to you at a cost of two and a half cents per kilowatt hour, you can store that stuff and deliver it for three cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. And if it's big enough, if you've if you're your batteries more than three cents for your power from the power company. If your batteries are big enough, if you if you're a utility or a or a company and and you've got a a solar farm, a wind farm, and big batteries, you've got what Next Era calls near firm 
uh, solar or near firm wind, which is as reliable as nuclear power for for uh, a production of electricity in peak demand periods for dispatch yeah, of electricity. Absolutely. And I, I, how nuclear power can can compete with that? I just I can't imagine. Which is why Next Era, which is by some metrics the biggest utility in the United States, which owns seven nuclear uh, power generators, including the one in Seabrook. And these people are putting zero into um, nuclear in the next 10 years, including small modular reactors, because they are forecasting that the electricity from those nuclear reactors will cost um, well, three, it's really expensive. three to five times as much as near-firm solar or near-firm wind. And they, nobody's even brought up the fact that near-firm solar and near-firm wind are producing better electricity. Why better? Because when you've got a nuclear power plant, you have to ramp electricity production up or down in order to, in order to, to meet, uh, match demand. But when, you've, when you're operating with these big batteries, you can match demand instantly. That's very interesting. It's better. Wouldn't you say it's better? I would say it's better. Yeah. So we've got to go on, Tom. Um, okay. We have a, we have a picture... Of a of a city called Gold Coast, and um, it's all in blue. Queensland, Australia. Yeah, it's all blue. It's not gold. It's just blue. You can tell by looking at the city. It's just blue. This is. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> I'm sorry. This is from PV Magazine, Australia. <clears throat> Nineteen billion dollars for energy, for energy transition in Queensland budget as it pushes state ownership. Yeah. Oaks coal. Socialists, what can you say? Okay, Queensland's government has allocated 19 billion Australian dollars, which is 12.9 billion American dollars, to deliver on its energy transition plan with a focus on public ownership of energy assets and that's interesting where they're coming from because they're pretty conservative. Yeah, Queensland's flush financial position was enabled by an increase in coal royalties. They, um, they're charging more for coal. And so, yes, the conservatives in the United States would just say this is socialism. And um, the Queensland is not pushing socialism. I'm sorry. Queensland is pushing rooftop solar, for, among other things. And rooftop solar is about as far from so socialism as you can get, unless you're talking to a U.S. Republican, a MAGA Republican. <laughs> I, you know, really, they, I, they say so, uh, uh, They say renewable energy is socialist. Renewable energy is socialist. Rooftop solar is socialist. <laughs> Off-grid electricity is socialist. How do you how do you do that? Okay, we're up to Wednesday. Anything that's not privately owned is socialist. Yes. We are up to Wednesday, June 14th, and we have a picture of the um, Hazelwood power plant, which is now closed. But you look at this thing, it's got... That's, that's in Australia, by the way. Yes, it is. And that is huge. You can tell by the, the that it's huge by the fact that it's got eight... Um, Count them all. Eight stacks. Eight stacks. This thing is, eight, eight separate power plants. Yeah, this is from you, Yahoo Finance. Oh, it is. It is that. Yeah. Historic moment in Australia's energy transition. The Hazelwood Battery Storage and Energy Storage System is commissioned. Right. Marking, this is historic. This is marking a new era. In Australia's energy transition, Hazelwood is the first retired coal-fired power station in the country to host a battery storage system. It is a key moment in repurposing former, former thermal assets for renewable technologies. Now, these thermal... So they've got the land. They've got to close it so they're opening it up for storage. Exactly. This is a brownfield site. This is a site that you don't want to use for anything. Because it's it's spoiled. It's got coal ash all over it. It's the the you don't want to eat. You know, if you raised vegetables in a garden on the soil, you would not want to eat them. I want to eat them, but yeah. you can put storage there. Absolutely. Matter. Yeah. Okay. Move on. 
Yeah, might as well. Can't do it. We've got a picture of wind turbines. Is that what they are? I think it is. Uh, this is from the, the Mail and Guardian, and the wind turbines are not with the article, but this article I found disturbing for a couple of reasons. But go ahead, Tom. China offers to donate 66 gigawatts of solar and wind power equipment to South Africa. Yeah. Now that's, yeah. Significant. that's a significant amount. That's enough to power the country, I bet. I don't know. Watch. Yeah, and this is 66 of them. This is like, this would be, you know, with with a, with the a capacity factor being different, this might be like d donating at least 15 big nuclear power plants. And they can do that for a reason that is a little sneaky. Okay, I'm going to read the synopsis. The Chinese government has offered to donate to South Africa solar panels and generators that can be installed on public institutions to prev uh, prevent power disruptions, according to Chen Dong, China's ambassador to South Africa. Now, there's a, there's a couple of little problems here. You'll notice, first of all, that this, these panels are supposed to be installed at public institutions. And like on the roof or something. I don't, I don't think there's enough room at public institutions in South Africa to install all this stuff. I think you're right. Well, they're going to have to install them on the on the on the land. Yeah, and and the w one of the things in the notes on the on the article says that the I forget who the official was in South Africa, and he said we have we have probably transmi transmission capacity that would be big enough to um, to install six gigawatts right now. <coughs> so I think the Chinese made a donation here that. They knew South Africa couldn't accept more than about ten percent of it. <coughs> U.S. versus sixty-six. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just, you know, there's. But on the other hand, it tells you how China is trying to insert itself into other people's affairs, and it's very worrying. Yes, it is. It's you got to watch out for China. Yeah, China, the nation of of uh, socialism and capitalism. Yep, mark my words. China is getting to be as bad as the United States was when it controlled a bunch of banana republics in Central America. Well, it's, it's pretty obvious that China is looking at the basically control the world. I think I, you know, I was being facetious when I said uh, that, that compared China with the United States, but I think you're right, Tom. China is trying to control the world, and this donation to South Africa was one step out of many that they're taking. And why can they get away with this? Well, it's simple. It's because MAGA Republicans want to deny that there's anything there. Yep. You know, I had that discussion with friends of mine who were conservatives, and I said something about carbon footprint, and the, the, one of them, this was probably 15 years ago, and one of them said, you believe in climate change? And I, <laughs> I, I, I said, if you don't believe in climate change, then you're, you're opting out of what is going to be the biggest business opportunity of the 21st century. Absolutely true. And that's what, you know, under various presidents, that's what we have been doing. Okay, we're up to our last article. Um, An interesting picture of a PV array in Georgia. That's correct. Let me Georgia, the United States, not Georgia, Russia. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if you put up, you know, do a Google search on PV uh, uh, photovoltaic systems in Georgia, you're going to get pictures with pe of people with weird costumes and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Stalin was from Georgia. Who? Joseph Stalin. Yes, he was. That's right. He was also, uh, when he was young, scheduled to become a priest. Uh huh. And I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know. I think if he were a priest, he probably would have been less destructive to human beings. Okay. <laughs> we have a, an article. Hey. From Energy to supply 15 megawatts, 1,500 megawatt hours batteries to Georgia Power. Yeah. 
That's the one I was that's talking about. Warm Energy, the company, the company name. Yeah, that's in Somerville. That's the one I mentioned earlier. And here it is. Form Energy is supplying a 15 megawatt, 1500 megawatt hour battery to Georgia, which means that they can run this battery at 15 megawatts flat out for 100 hours straight. Bingo. And this is the one that they were saying could deliver electricity at half a cent per kilowatt hour. I'm sorry, ah. I, I chose to put in a solar array because the battery system was one that we had already seen and it was pretty boring. Um, Forum Energy it's, announced- it's solar array is just nothing growing underneath it and, and yeah. there could be, and yeah. should be. Yeah, Forum Energy announced that it's moving forward with its agreement with Georgia Power, a subsidiary of Southern Company, to deploy a 15 megawatt, 1500 megawatt hour iron air battery system. Iron air is important. I will explain it in a minute. The hey, battery, I, I don't know what it is myself. Okay, the battery system is expected to come online as early as 2026. Now, iron air, how does iron air work? It's kind of weird. When iron rusts, which it does when it's exposed to air under the right circumstances or the wrong circumstances. That's a chemical process. That's right. It 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 yields electricity that can be that can be harvested. When you so take rusting iron is a natural normal thing, and you can harvest electricity from it. That's correct. Now, that's if that. you push electricity back into the the uh, um, battery, the iron it unrusts. It unrusts. <laughs> And that means it can rust again. Now, I will point out there's no cobalt in this. There's no lithium in this. There's no oh, other exotic... expensive elements. This is, this is a cheaper battery to make. This is a cheaper battery. And the one thing that prevents it from being taken up all over the place, as, as I can understand it, and there isn't a lot of information about form energy, but I'm going to try to get some... The one thing is these batteries tend to be rather large. So they require a fair amount of, of, um, of uh, uh, land to, to build them. But nevertheless, this is, um, you know, this well, is... Well, there's developments in the way of batteries, and uh, one of the least developed versions of that are batteries. Yes, that's right. They so, have an awful lot of potential. They do. We're looking at a whole bunch of different kinds of batteries, as you've pointed out. Lithium batteries are one kind. You can store a lot of electricity in lithium. Um, and that's mostly because lithium is very reactive and very light. Well, with flow batteries, the flowing material can be water. Yeah. And the, it goes from one pond to another pond and back again all the time. That's right. Yeah, we've got a lot of options, and we can go. Now, Tom, we are up to the end of our show. I think that's what it says. So I'm going to put up my last slide, which says, have a positively great week. And I can tell all of our huge audience, all three people, <laughs> <laughs> you come on, and what you say it, Tom. You always do it so well. Come on back now. Oh, come back now, you hear? That's right. You can, you, can, you can know that that's real because Tom was raised in, where were you raised, Tom? The Bronx. The Bronx. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> they all talk like that in the Bronx. They all talk like that in the Bronx. In the movies, in the movies they talk like that. Huh? In the movies. Okay. Who, who, where did you get that from? I'm not sure. Yeah, it sounds like... Mostly a southern accent. Well, it sounds like cowboys. Okay, cowboys, yeah. Okay. <laughs>